Hello, I'm Professor Liu. Welcome to our live stream. I'm here with Art Prof teaching artist Lauren Welch. We are going to be talking today about art commissions, pretty complicated projects, lots of things that you guys need to know to make sure that the process goes smoothly for you. If you want to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques and tutorials. By the way, we have two more days left for the Art Prof Spring Raffle. And I really hope you guys will consider donating because we have all kinds of super cool prizes for you guys. For example, if you pledge a dollar once a month on Patreon, you can get stickers, you can get mystery art supplies. We even have my book, which you can get for a $1 pledge. But we also have really cool stuff like original artwork that has actually been featured in a lot of our tutorials. Like for example, this bird print from Lauren, $150 one-time donation. It's in our rubber stamp tutorial. If you guys watch my live stream on the Twilight Zone, one of these sketches is going to be in the raffle. And also this drawing here, which is from our Guangzhou drawing on site in China video. So check it out. The link is in the video description below. Please support us if you guys want us to stay alive because honestly, every month I say to myself, how much longer are we going to be able to do this? It's and if we can crazy. get a bigger budget, it's way more likely that we will stay alive, basically. Okay, let's talk about commissions because first of all, there's lots of different types of commissions. And Lauren and I are very different, but I would just say that every artist has their own way of doing commissions. So what we talk about our process, it may not work for everybody, but we will cover logistical things that I do think apply to all artists across the board. So yes. Lauren, what types of commissions have you done in the past? So I have done a variety of things. One of the biggest commissions that I have done is a mural for a private facility. Uh, it was for a, a gym, a pool area. That was probably my most intense commission. And I think more often, though, I get commissions for doing, say, portraits of people or cats. Cats are my favorite. And I keep this very limited on purpose because actually commissions don't make up a large, a huge part of my art income. They're a fairly small part that I do like on an as needed basis. So I, I just try to do the things that I really like to do. What about you? I pretty much will not look at a commission unless it's going to pay me at least $5,000 <laughs> because I have to admit, Lauren, I hate doing commissions. I find oh, them no. so painful. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't yeah. fit my personality. I just find them incredibly hard. I mean, part of it is also that I've been somewhat, I would say, um, traumatized <laughs> by a couple oh, of yep. experiences. I'm going to tell you guys all my stories later on. But it's interesting that commissions are not a good fit for everybody. I think a lot of people make the assumption, oh, that's great. It's a job where you get paid to make art. But actually, sometimes it's really unpleasant. So Lauren, how would you say somebody knows that they're cut out to do commissions? Yeah, I think it's something, it's, yeah, it's really something that you have to listen to your gut about. I remember when I was in art school, I originally wanted to go into illustration because I knew that illustrators did commissions and I thought commissions were the only job one could do to um, make money off of their art or to make a living off of their art. And I quickly found out that that type of prompt where you are given a prompt, you're given something that you have to follow some guidelines of really rubbed against the grain of, you know, who I am, like from the, 
from the subject trying to come up with something interesting for the subject to like trying to fit specific media or um, deadline sets or setups. Um, that was really difficult for me. So that was actually one of the reasons why I changed my major and changed the type of work that I did. However, I also that also helped me figure out a way to handle commissions when I needed to take them or, um, you know, when I wanted to take them, I realized I could set limitations for myself that made it easier for me to say, follow those guidelines. So I really think it's like you have to trust yourself inside um, or really dig deep and be like, oh, is this something that really makes sense for the kind of work that I do? Can I actually follow follow through with these guidelines that people have given me? Annie Helgeson is saying, it seems so hard to make a commission when you don't get to pick the subject. So much of art is conceptually motivated. It almost seems like you have to do assignments as a career. Well, that's not necessarily true though, Annie, because I think if you tell people look, I draw cats, Lauren draws cats, and you enjoy drawing cats, Lauren, people will yeah. come to you because they see that that's something you do. Now, if you ask me for a dog drawing, I'm not into that. And so I would never advertise myself as somebody who does dog commissions. So part right. of it is how you show what it is that you do. So Lauren, let's start with how to get the word out there. How do you tell people? that you're available for commissions? Do you use Instagram or for example, do you have information on your website? So for me, because I don't publish these things or I don't want to get a ton of commissions that often, I'm not saying I don't want commissions at all, but because I usually work in a very controlled way with them, I usually offer things like events where I offer a special deal on a type of artwork. I'm like, hey, I. I want to do this type of artwork right now. Um, if you sign up on my list right here, you can either DM me on Facebook or Instagram or email me. I will put you on this list. This is where you are in the queue on that list. Uh, it, causes, it costs this much. It's a flat rate. I will give you this many revisions on it. Like I set it up all ahead of time. So people basically, all they have to do is like put their name down and give me like the, the re resource images that I, I need, the reference images. Like, um, so it's not listed on my website, but if I'm putting together an event like this, I will post it on my Instagram and my Facebook and I get usually a really good community response from this. I mean, it's another reason why you guys, if you want to do commissions, you really have to have the social media presence. It's so effective. I found yeah. Instagram way more effective than my website. My website's important and I use it for certain things, but not so much for when people actually want to get in touch with me. So I would say if you guys have not set up your social media and you want to sell and you want to do commissions, that is almost the first thing you need to do because you yeah. can't advertise if you don't have an Instagram. Yeah. Okay, let's talk a little bit about style because as you guys know, me and Lauren are really different artists. We have different styles. We work in different media. Lauren's super colorful and vibrant. I tend to be more a black and white artist. So Lauren, you were saying that actually clients sometimes don't do their research very well on what type of arts you are. Yeah, I would say that's actually more of the norm and less of the exception. I have a lot of people from my community that know that I'm an artist. I'm very active in my local uh, local regular community and my arts community. So they all know that I am an artist. But um, I think that there is an assumption that other people um, might have run into here too, where uh, people think that just because you can do one type of creative work, it means that you can do all types of creative work. So for instance, I have gotten asked to do logos, to do graphic design work, to do illustration work um, that, you know, I don't have a ton of like digital media skills, for instance. I am actually terrible at doing most graphic design things. I can use Illustrator, but on a very minimal kind of basis, you know? So I always ask people first, 
Um, have you looked at my website? Here is the link. This is the kind of work that I do. Does this style or does this medium fit within your vision of uh, commissioned artwork? Albert is asking, how do you weigh declining a commission based on ethics versus the payment to pay for bills? Is there a decision process in this dilemma? I I think, Albert, that's a really good question, but I have a feeling we need another stream to dig into that because that oh, yeah. is a big topic that I don't think we have time for today. But thank you for asking. We always take notes when you guys give us suggestions for topics for streams. So definitely keep giving us those suggestions in the chat. Yeah, I think the thing that I've realized about commissions, Lauren, is that, you know what? Clients have no idea what they want. They do know what they don't want, but mm -hmm. only when they can see it. So yes. if you guys feel like you can go to a client and say, well, what are you looking for? What do you don't do that? <laughs> because whatever they think they want, it's not really what they want. And they just can't identify it until it's right in front of them. I mean, one thing that I say to people, and I know this isn't always applicable for everybody, but if you have a commission and you can meet face to face, I would. Because let me tell you, Lauren, the one commission I did that was a total nuclear meltdown disaster was over email. And most of my portrait commissions that I've done have all been face to face. And I think there's a filter there. People have to not be horrible when you meet to them face to face for the most part. I know it's not always possible. I know you do a lot of commissions online, but I do think that that helps quite a bit. Yeah, I, I would say that actually you do have a point there because most of the people that do commission me are actually people that I know in some vicinity or other that I have met face to face, you know, so I, I do think that element is important. It's really hard to get a commission from a stranger where you don't know anything about them at all, about what they like and what they don't like and their, you know, their needs and their aesthetics. Yeah, because actually, I think most of the portrait commissions that I did, people either met me in person at an Open Studios event and they saw my work yeah. there and I was able to speak to them or they knew about me through word of mouth. And so, for example, I have never done a portrait commission online before. I've always done them in person, and I prefer it. I think it's much better. I think you communicate better. Of course, not now, but in the yeah, future. Yeah, yeah. Denise is saying, would you be able to mention advice on creating an artist resume without having any experience? That is also a great topic for another stream, Denise. Really? However... If you would like to get some information on it, I do talk about artist resumes quite a bit in the artist website stream. So look this up. It's in a playlist called Career Advice for Artists. And I would just say, you guys, check out that playlist because we have all kinds of videos on pricing, on selling. All of these videos are interrelated because inevitably when we talk about this, we talk about pricing. So I recommend looking at all those things. Now, Lauren, Jordan actually has made up this commissioned um, list. Let me show, oh, sorry, this is the wrong slide. So Jordan put together this image where he has all his information in one place. And I love this chart because I feel like it's really easy to read. It's very straightforward. And what's interesting about it is he actually has a section on it that says, this is what I do do. This is what I don't do. Why do you think that matters to say what you don't do? Oh, man, because there's nothing worse than trying to do a commission of something that you don't do. Because, again, it's like, as I said before, if someone is asking me for, say, a tattoo or a logo, that kind of that takes a specific language. And that's a language that I don't have. And so I don't want to I don't want to falsely advertise what I do and don't do. And I also don't necessarily like want to go through that whole conversation of that, you know, that takes time and I don't want to let people down. So it's really easier to just like nip that conversation in the bud and be like, you know, hey, I, I don't do, I, I don't draw nudes, for example, or hey, I don't draw portraits of babies. That's, you know, a thing, stuff like that. I think it's, it's much easier to just put it out there like on this, 
uh, commission list that, that Jordan put out. And then you don't even have to have the conversation. People are like, the information is just right there. John Murph says commissions are pretty tough. Are cats your only subject matter? No, they are not. I do do lots of different things. It's just um, the, the cats thing is kind of like a, it, it comes up because um, I did a series like a couple years ago where I needed like really quick money. And then I ended up with like a slew of commissions that were just cats. So I've got like a lot of like disproportional amount of like cat material. Uh, but I have done commissions of people, of landscapes, of, uh, you know, homes, uh, it, it runs the gamut of painting, really. Now, I also think it's really important to either offer specs, in which case we're looking at Jordan's right now. He explains the work is digital. Unless specified, he does 300 DPI. This is the size. He tells you it's available in JPEG, PNG. He explains flat color. And so he's really clear about what you're going to get. Because if you just say, yeah, I do digital stuff, then it's like, well, but how big and what resolution yeah. and is it this or is it that? And it, there's just too many things to work out. And I'll tell you, the size can be a huge issue. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think one of the commissions I did, I seriously spent two hours at this woman's house measuring the wall in relation to the painting and the piano that was next to it. It was a big deal for us to figure out exactly what size the painting needed to be. So these logistical things, is it a painting on stretched canvas? Is it digital? Is it color? Is it shading? Lay this stuff out. Make it really clear for people. Don't let them determine how to do that. Do you do that, yeah. Lauren, with the specs and everything? Oh, definitely. I feel like, Clara, you're going way too far into customer care there. That's a lot of work to get it exactly down to the inch. And then you're talking about making like a custom size canvas and all that. Like when I do this, I really offer like several different sizes with several different price points. Um, I offer two different types of, um, I'm going to call them media. One is the acrylic marker on illustration board, which is the cheaper option. And the other one is the acrylic painting on canvas, which is the more expensive option just because it's a materials thing. And then I'm like, you can have the really small version, which is affordable. You can have the middle version, you know, and, and they're all standard size sizes too that are um you know like ones that aren't weird like you know 18 by 24 9 by 12 inches like that kind of stuff and then by offering these things and having like straight up price points for them I don't have to do like all this extra calculating work and usually actually the client feels better about having less choices like uh, I have not really had an experience so far where the client has liked to have like a ton of choices. It's very stressful for them. So that kind of streamlines things for me. Igor Tanaka says here in Brazil, selling prints like copies is very common, but people that have an Instagram or YouTube channel with a big number of followers normally have many orders of commissions to do their art. Yeah, I mean, that following does play a role into how many commission pieces you get. The remaining piece says, I have to make mine cheaper because I have no audience. I get at least three a week as a high school student, but when I make mine just a little higher, I get nothing. Any tips? What would you say, Lauren, to do in that situation? Because I get it. I mean, if you don't have a huge following, you feel like you can't demand higher yeah. prices. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it's a little difficult. It depends how much you like the work. So for me, for instance, the how much do I need commissions? Usually, you know, I've got like a couple other sources of work. Like one of my big um, sources of income is I sell uh, prints and cards of things. Like I sell editions of things or I sell originals of artwork of my personal work. So I can afford to say uh, boost the price of my commissions because I don't I, I don't need to have like a ton of them at one time. Um, but if you are in that situation where you need like a lot of fast money and you don't mind like having to do that work, then you can put the price lower and that's also fine. And also just 
like when you are a high school student and you want to like get your name out there, like maybe it is appropriate to have a kind of deal where you're doing cheaper commissions. But I do think definitely that you want to raise your prices over time, especially if you're getting three a week. That's I would say that's a I think that's, that's a, a fair- lot. Yeah, I, I would say that's a lot. I mean, especially if you're spending like a, a large amount of time on these, like that, that is a ton of work. For sure. And I think that for some people in high school, they're really just trying to get experience. They're trying to feel it out a little bit. And so I think you just have to ask yourself, what is my priority here? Am I just trying to get experience and just do a lot of commissions, which is valuable to have that experience? Or do I just want to make money? So you have to ask yourself, which one is more important? If you really want the experience, then maybe lower prices will get you more. But then if it's like, oh, I don't want to be bothered. But then when I do get the money, it is worth the time. So I think it really remaining piece has to do with your priorities as an artist. Yeah, I think also it's like you want to be able to put in your 200 percent in your commissions. You don't want to, like we're talking about like, oh, they're such a chore, but I I think that's like not quite the right feeling that I want to uh, convey about commissions. It's like when you get a commission, you want to feel really good about that. You want to make like the best possible thing for your client. Like, so in putting your prices at, you know, upping your prices to an appropriate point, or um, limiting your media or do any, doing any of the stuff that we're talking about. It's really to create the best experience between you and your client so your client gets exactly the kind of work that they want and, so, and also so you feel really good about the work that you're making for that client. Bradolf is saying, is it good to have a presence on multiple art sites or do I have to focus on Instagram if I want to offer online commissions? I think, Bradolf, it really depends on the type of commissions. Like the type of commissions that I was doing were like big scale oil paintings. They were portraits. That clientele, they don't hang out on Instagram. (laughs) They're very much word of mouth. But I think smaller commissions, digital stuff, definitely Instagram, I think, is the way to go. And some sites are better than others. I mean, There's this site, I think it's called FASO. It's like Fine Art America or something. And I get a lot of artists who ask me about that site. And I'm like, I never use it. They're like, but all the artists use it. I'm like, yeah, but your target audience is not artists. I never commission work. (laughs) You know, (laughs) like that's just not the way it works in terms of clientele. Okay, let's look at Jordan's commission sheet because Jordan has rates that are already set in advance. Why do you think that's important to do, Lauren? Oh, there's, it's, it's very stressful when you are talking with a client, you, you you know, you really want to make the sale and you really want to make the commission and uh, you have to come up with a rate right then and there. Like that is a stressful and very emotional situation. And this is similar to how I would feel about say, pricing your work ahead of time before you have like a gallery event or an open studio or something like that. Uh, You want to set your prices when you are feeling the most level headed and the least emotional about the work or about the sale. So that way you can just, you can bring it up really quickly. You don't have to agonize over it it's it's like all set for sure so I would just have a range at least so like I usually do it by size so I say an oil painting that's about 18 by 24 is going to cost this amount if it's two feet by four feet it's going to cost this amount it just is so much easier when you're negotiating with your client when you can look at hard numbers if you just say to them well how much can you pay me I mean (laughs) you're never going to get out of that meeting so keeping things more specific really helps. Here's a very important part of commissions. You guys have to protect yourselves because wow, people are so quick to take advantage of you and make you do stuff unpaid and make your life really, really difficult. So for example, one thing that I always say, and this is across the board, this is not just commissions. When you guys do work, freelance anything, get it in writing, okay? Don't have some verbal agreement that you have with the other person. Oh, yes, we're going to do this, especially with friends, because, wow, that friendship can crash and burn 
Lauren, why do you think getting things in writing is so important? Uh, again, artwork is a very emotional thing. Um, especially portraits, I think, are a very emotional thing. That's awesome. Or that's um, very often a commissioned kind of thing is getting your likeness painted. Um, so people can start out being like, oh, you know, I want this. And this is like, you can do this for me and I'll do it at this rate. And then things, things go wrong. Th like it can take longer than expected. It can take more materials than expected. It can take more revisions than expected. And again, as you said earlier, clients often really do not know what they want. Um, this is myself included. This isn't like some kind of like weird bias I have as an artist. A lot of the time, like I might have an idea, but it really takes like a, a long time or a lot of iterations before I even understand what it is that I am looking for. So you want to be able to control the situation in some way, be like, okay, so this is how much we're agreeing to do this for. I'm going to spend this amount of time on it. You get this many revisions on it. You want to make sure that um, you have something solid to come back to. I mean, I do things like I make a schedule and I explain to them, here's the process. The first stage is a consultation. The second stage, we're going to do a photo shoot. Third stage, we do thumbnails. There's an approval process. So for example, when I do a commission for a portrait, I have certain checkpoints. So let's say a checkpoint is the thumbnail sketches. And we say, okay, if we approved the sketches, we're then going to move on. And if you want me to go back and redo the sketches because you changed your mind, you're going to get charged more for that. Because, wow, people change their minds all the time. I once did this portrait commission for this woman, and we had this very dark, dramatic, chiaroscuro background. And I was seriously 75% done with the oil painting. And she calls me up one day. She's like, I don't like the black background. My mom's going to think it means death. Can we change it to yellow? And yeah. I really would like to have my hair be more a part of my identity in the portrait. And come to think of it, I really wish my daughter would be wearing this red sweater. And I didn't have any checkpoints or additional charges built in. I basically had to almost repaint the whole thing from scratch. And so you can end up doing a crazy amount of work without extra pay if you don't create those checkpoints. I think that's really important. And then there's also the commissions that won't end. You ever have one of those, Lauren? I've had a couple of them. For the most part, I've actually been pretty lucky in that regard. Again, I keep things very limited as far as what I'll do and when I'll do it. But I do think I have witnessed this both in my friends. I see Eloise on here and I know she's had some experiences like this. And also my sibling, Storm. Storm, uh, she's or they're an illustrator and uh, do a lot of commissions, you know. And uh, they've had situations like that where they've, say, done a, a environmental activism poster or album cover or something. And the person is just like, oh, can you revise this again? Oh, the smile is not quite right. Can you do it again? Can you do it again? And what started as something that was only supposed to take a few hours and they'd only paid for for a few hours uh, turns into like a monumental kind of task that takes like a hundred hours and it really uh, degrades it degrades both the relationship and then also like the the commission process in general. Rania Ali is saying what should we do to get started with to get commissions both online and real life? The first thing I would do Rania is do what Jordan has here which is this commission, list. I mean, you don't have to make it a visual like this. For me, if I was doing portrait commissions, it would not look good for me to have this type of format. But for Jordan's style, this looks great. And so whether you put the specs and the information in an image or on your website or however you want to do it, you have to start figuring out these logistics, like how much am I going to charge? What subject am I going to do? Basically, all the points that we're talking about you have to start making concrete decisions about what you want to do. And once you compile that information and put it in one place, 
then you start pushing it and telling people about it on social media. So actually, it's a lot of work to get started. This is not something you just show up on Instagram. Hey, I'm taking commissions. Like, I would not do that. You need to be a little bit more prepared with some of the logistics. Now, another thing that can protect you guys is if you require a non-refundable deposit. This, I think, is absolutely critical because I have had clients just disappear. Like, they just never called me again. And if you don't get a non-refundable deposit, you're screwed because they disappear and then you don't get paid. So I always ask for a third payment up front. Sometimes I have a second payment when we're halfway through. And then when they acknowledge that the commission is finished, they pay the rest of the deposit. So do you do non-refundable deposits, Lauren? I think it is a really good practice. And if I were to do commissions on a more regular basis, I would definitely participate in that practice. I personally don't do that because um, one thing that is part of my commission uh, setup for myself is that I, you know, I have a very busy schedule doing a lot of different things, but I still want to take on some outside projects sometimes. So I ask for a flexible deadline. And that can mean sometimes that people are waiting for a while to receive their work. So I personally uh, don't do this because I don't want to be beholden to like a particular deadline to finish something. I think if like in the future, if this becomes like a more like a bigger part of my business, I would definitely do it though, because you do run into this issue where you could very easily not get paid for all of the hard work that you do. Speaking as somebody who has done that before, (laughs) when I just got out of art school and I didn't know a thing about any of this stuff, I remember I got a commission once, it was from a community center, and one of the people I spoke to said, oh, well, we were thinking about something really playful and bright, like a Matisse painting of a Klausmer band. And I said, oh, great. And so I really wanted to show them how responsible I was, and I was going to do a great job and do all this research and everything. And so I actually called all these local Klausmer bands and asked them if I could come and shoot photos of them as references. And I was like, wow, I'm being so on top of it and so responsible and everything. And so I made all these sketches. I did these preliminary paintings. I did tons of work. And I show up with this stuff, this committee. No, nobody on this committee is an artist. And literally, Lauren, one woman said to me, these are scary looking. I'm like, this is a pretty picture of a Klezmer band. Like, <laughs> they were insane. And then... By the time we were done with the meeting, they decided they didn't want the Klezmer band anymore. And they wanted a collage that was mixed media of children dancing with music in a garden. And then after they determined that, they never called me again. And so I did all that work with no pay. And after that experience, I'm like, I'm not going to lift a finger until you guys pay a deposit and we have signed a contract. So yeah. you guys, you got to really protect yourselves so here. That That is actually a thing, too. In talking about this, Clara, you often take on commissions that take a lot of work, a lot of, I'm going to call it like research ahead of time. Like you put in a lot of um, hours, uh, a lot of labor for that. And so the the prices that you're charging are obviously like going to be pretty high. I think that there can be kind of a difference between the uh, safeguards that you put up for yourself and the process that you go through for like a more expensive commission versus like something that is I'm going to call it lower risk because it's like lower price. Um, like some of those things that you've talked about they haven't happened to me because I usually don't have to deal with that stuff. I usually don't um, engage with commissions of that, you know, intensity, that high level. But But you do need to realize that it can happen at any level. Right, right. But I think like as the risk gets higher or like as the, the price point gets higher and the labor gets higher, like, the more those things become like important, like they're very, they, they, like you need to have them. It's like an insurance policy, you know? Thank you so much for the super chats from Damara Carpenter and Tammy Dreiger. We really appreciate your support, you guys. 
Thank you so much for all of that. What about invoices, Lauren? Are these necessary? Oh, yes. I am an invoice queen. I love invoices. Um, Personally, I am someone that uh, makes, you know, an income off of my artwork. So I file a tax return every year. Uh, What is it? The form is a C. Section C is what I know it as. And in a section C, you need to show every incoming check or payment or whatever, and every outgoing payment. And it's just a real hassle. This is a US thing. But I think just in general, it's really good to have a record of where you're getting money from and where it's going out to. And similarly, that person needs to have some kind of receipt for the the artwork they have received. They are receiving a good. So again, it's part of that paper trail that you want to create for yourself um, through this whole commission process. By the way, if you guys want more information about those nuts and bolts, Schedule C, the invoice, all that, I would watch this stream, Business Tips for Artists, because I do go over that really nuts and bolts specifics about all of those things, because that's pretty important to go over. Okay, let's talk about framing, to frame or not. My opinion is that it is much better for you to leave that for the client because first of all, framing is expensive. Custom framing is expensive. And I just feel like it's one more thing I don't wanna deal with. (laughs) So I always tell clients, framing is up to you. I am not a part of it because I actually had one commission. It was like a four foot oil painting And the woman wanted me to like go with her to the frame shop and consult. I just was like, oh, this is so not my job. So my suggestion is to not include framing. I mean, do you include framing ever, Lauren? Oh, never. I mean, people. Okay, so my in my house, my family buys a lot of artwork and collects a lot of artwork and they always want to frame it for the house. And that is a whole process unto itself. I have seen so much of that very fraught process. I never want to be a part of it. Um, There are reasons beyond framing, um, beyond like the frame itself and choosing the frame and making sure it fits the house that make it like not a good idea to include within the commission uh, realm. Uh, One of that or one of those is, is shipping, for instance, to send something that is framed is a lot more difficult than sending something that's unframed like glass and uh, the frame itself. It, you, it just requires like a level of care beyond, um, you know, the, the basic price range. It's, it's a lot. Blue Wolf Spirit is saying, are there generic contract forms that can be used as a template? There might be, but I'll tell you when I was doing portrait commissions, What I was doing was so specific that I could not find anything like that. So I would just say maybe the way to do it is to speak to somebody who has actually done it and then ask them, what are some of the subjects that you should cover? Because actually one thing that I do, I create a whole quote post commission agreement. So I actually have part of the contract where the client has to sign and say, I now acknowledge that this commission is complete And then if I request any further work, I need to pay a fee for that. Because I had a former student tell me that she had this commission that just would not end. Like they kept bothering her. I need this file and I need this version. And they just would not let up. And so I think some kind of agreement about, okay, when are you going to cut the cord and say, you can't bother me anymore unless you pay more is important to do. I don't know if you do that, Lauren. I do that for bigger projects. I think for something smaller, it may not be as important, but it's really helped me get out of some sticky situations. Yeah, I definitely, um, I I think that that's part of the contract process or should be included in the contract. I definitely at least like make it very clear like what I will and will not do like after the painting or whatever has been complete. Like, I I think offering a digital file, like, once is okay, but, like, all that extra stuff, again, it depends on the size and, like, what the actual commission is. Like, you know, if you're doing, like, a public work, obviously you're going to have way different 
um, a way different agreement than someone that's doing like a little portrait or something. But um, yeah, it's absolutely important to have because otherwise it will stretch on and on. I mean, for me, I actually had to speak to my clients about whether I could show an image of their portrait publicly, whether I was allowed to show it in a classroom as an example. And so things like privacy are also important too. Like you just always don't want to assume. You always want to ask because it never hurts to ask, but it can definitely hurt to not ask. Yes. So I really, really recommend doing that. Now, Lauren, why do you think I hate doing commissions so much? <laughs> Oh, Clara, you're such a free spirit. <laughs> you, you, you have your own, you march to the beat of your own drum. I, I think um, there is a certain kind of, um, I'm going to call it like a, a, a flexibility with dealing with people that can, it's a skill, you know, there's a kind of skill that comes along with uh, working through commissions that is not related to the artwork at all. It's just related to communicating with people on this one-on-one -on -one kind of basis. And that takes a lot of energy. And I don't know, I'm, I'm, that is where I am coming from here. Like, is that, is that true for you? I just feel Lauren that I've had so many just crazy clients. Like for example, this portrait I'm showing you now, this was an older woman and she wanted just a charcoal portrait of herself done. And I did another version. I really wish I had a photo of it to show you guys, because in my opinion, it was way better than the one you're looking at now, which is the one that she accepted. This woman had a total like emotional breakdown in front of me. She was so angry about the portrait that I did. And she said that she saw her mortality and oh how dare God. I draw her like this. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know what to do about this. It was really, really uncomfortable. And so that was not fun. And I've also had yeah. people who just sort of disappear. Like I did this portrait for somebody and they paid me for it, but I don't know, it was kind of strange. Like we never really told each other, yes, we're good. Like. I don't know. I just feel like clients are so weird, especially when you're drawing them, because yeah, they never yeah. think that what they look like in real life is what they actually look like. They all have ideas about what they think they look like. Yeah. I've had older women, I'm sorry, older women, but I've had a lot of older women get very angry with me when I painted a couple wrinkles. And it's just a really sensitive thing. How people look, I think, is very hard. That's why I actually think the cat commissions are better because you don't have the cats bothering you about their likeness. Yes. Um, Clara, you have hit the nail on the head. And for anybody that asked earlier, um, yes. So that is actually one of the big reasons why I mostly do cat commissions uh, is because you know, this might be something I have to go to therapy over, I guess. And I, I mentioned this on the Discord, but back in high school, I got a uh, commission from someone when I really didn't know what I was doing. She wanted me to draw her boyfriend and her baby and her. And she gave me some very low res photos and they were too low res for me to work with. So I pulled some different ones like from her Facebook to try to like piece it together. I thought I did a really good job, you know? I uh, worked really hard on this, way too hard on this for the amount of money that I, that I got for it. And uh, put something together that looked a lot better than the photos. And she like got really mad at me. Like I gave it to her and she got really mad at me that it, you know, it wasn't like the photos, the photos that were really bad. Um, and so, and she wanted her money back and I was like, it, it was just a bad experience, you know, all around terrible experience. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not drawing babies anymore. I am only going to draw people under special circumstances. Um, and yeah, it, I, I do think it's true that people love their cats very much, but they, you know, cats are not people. They don't like... People don't, people really care about a particular face. People don't really care about what their cat looks like if it's like absolutely perfect. Same with dogs, but dogs are more particular, I've found. 
Well, I'll tell you, Lauren, I had one very large portrait commission, which I can't show you for privacy reasons. I think it was like a four foot tall painting and I worked on it for a long time. And I remember it went so well that I was like nervous because I was like waiting for the other shoe to drop. I'm like, what's wrong with this client? They're really nice and they like everything I do. And I realized, oh, it's because the painting is of her two-year-old kids who have no idea what's going on and the client was not in the painting. And so it was sort of a win-win situation. It's just when the person who's commissioning the portrait is actually in the portrait, that gets very complicated really fast. Yeah. John Murph is saying, would you suggest consulting a lawyer first to create a standard contract that you can use for the rest of your life? I can tell you that I've never done that before. I just have stuff written down. But I would say if you really are nervous about it, it doesn't hurt. It's just lawyers are expensive. and <laughs> A lot of people um, don't really want to pay for that. So it's up to you. I mean, I don't think it would be a bad thing to do that. I'm going to say go that for as far as I know, for commissions, if you worst comes to worst and you need to take it to like a small claims course or whatever, as long as you have stuff down in writing about the agreement, then that is generally enough. You don't need to get any extra stuff for that. Angelic Enigma is saying, when you sell a work, is the image still yours or forever the client's only, like if you retain images of it? The physical artwork does belong to the client, but because you made the artwork, you are the one that owns the rights to those images. So you would have to sell the rights. I've never had to deal with that before. I mean, it's not really an issue with the type of work that I do but I have not had that be a problem. Have you, Lauren? Yeah, not not yet. Um, there have been some cases where I have, you know, usually what happens, I say, if, you know, you want to use this in some like other format, just ask. And that has been just fine. Right. I mean, if I did a portrait painting of somebody, I wouldn't just plaster it on a book cover. I would definitely be asking the client yeah. first if I can do that. I think that's just a courtesy thing to think about. Yeah. Puck Puck is saying, I think all artists need to have at least one bad experience to learn how to deal with those kinds of clients or to see if you want to do commission work. Absolutely. Definitely. And I think you guys, just because a commission is technically making artwork, it doesn't mean it's better than doing something else for a paid gig. Like I did this stream, you guys might wanna watch this. It's called an art job can ruin your studio practice. A lot of people assume that if your job is making art, that must be the best thing ever, but actually it is not sometimes. Sometimes it can be, other times it really yeah. can ruin you as an artist. So I don't think it's as black and white as a lot of people think in terms of commissions. Lauren, what would you say was your most traumatic commission experience? Oh, I, I, I've already told you about it. That one with the... Oh, the, that was the one with the bad photos? The the, yeah, it still burns me to this day. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, my worst commission experience, and I should have known not to do this. I feel like I walked into it, but at the time I needed the income and the money was pretty good. So I thought, okay... I know this client's a pain in the butt, but let me just do it anyway. So basically the slide you guys are looking at now, I had all these crayon drawings that I'd already made. So on the left-hand side, you guys can see that's the original drawing. And so this person found my stuff online and they were a filmmaker and they said, oh, I really like these. I want you to recreate these drawings for my film, but I want to make these changes. And that's where it all went downhill <laughs> because they were saying to me, oh, we want this sun in the upper right hand corner and we want you to turn the head so it's not a side view. They weren't major changes, but they were enough to be a pain in the butt. And so I actually made these three pieces. So I'm showing you the second one right now. And you can see they're very similar. And they're pretty big pieces. I didn't spend a huge amount of time on them, but they took a while. Like this one we're looking at now, the third one, you can see they had me move the figure over to the left. And again, you see the sun in the upper right-hand corner. And I'll tell you when I sent these to the client, this is the 
email client, somebody I didn't meet in person. I'm not joking, Lauren, the most horrible email I have ever read in my life. I have never <laughs> emailed like What did like, it I was say? like almost in tears after I read it. It was so horrific. It was so bad that you know what I actually did. And normally I would never advise an artist to do this. I totally said full refund and walked away, even though I'd already made the work because I realized, you know what? This guy is such a jerk that if I continue to work with him and try to actually adhere to his changes, number one, it's going to be terrible. And number three, I'm never going to satisfy him because of what he yeah. said in that email. And I think this for me, th this was the straw that broke the camel's back where I just said, goodbye, <laughs> I'm done with commissions. Yeah, that I sometimes you just need to go with your gut and okay, so I yeah, I think in these situations first of all, do not send if you get like a really bad response to like some kind of commission that you're done that you've done for a person, do not send a response right away. I think that's a bad idea. You need to let yourself cool off. You need to let them cool off. You need to gather all your resources, talk it out with a few people and see what your next step should be. Because again, this commission where you're in like a bad situation or it's taken a wrong turn, it's a very emotional situation where you're dealing with another person and you're dealing with money and it's like really difficult. So um, you, you don't want to be reactive. Um, and then after you've taken some time to figure out, uh, okay, where do I stand in this? You can make the decision, oh, do I want to cut the cord? Oh, is this worth salvaging in some way? Uh, am I protected? Can I, can I leave this and be okay? Um, you, you really just want to think it through before, you know, cutting it off. Well, for me, it actually really did end up being the best solution because I still have these drawings and actually I sold two of them last week. So in the end, it was really okay. But I think sometimes you just have to take a step back and look at the situation and just say, listen, is this really worth the trouble? Because at that point, it really was not. Yep. Elena Johnson is saying commissions sound stressful. I mean, I think it's just your reaction. I'm the type of person I just... I don't know if I'm too old. I just can't put up with it anymore. Like it just drives me insane. Like there's yeah. so many other things I would rather do to get a paycheck. And so for me, it doesn't make sense. I mean, if they asked me to paint President Obama and I was Amy Sherrill, <laughs> I would not turn that down. But there's a lot of stuff I definitely would turn down. I, you know, I, I think that it's we so far we've made the sound like commissions are really bad and i don't want people to come away with that idea that they are bad because that's not that's not the situation i think what we're trying to get at here is commissions can be like a really volatile thing if you don't really like put some controls down for yourself and but they can be super enjoyable and they are super enjoyable if you like know what you want out of them like where you thrive and if you like communicating with people and like creating artwork for other people like it can be wonderful i know tons of people that you know do spend a lot of their time doing commissions for people and really, really enjoy it. it. Again, it just comes down to what you like to do and how best you can do that. Puck Puck is saying, would going over the contract beforehand with the client change costs, penalties, help? I did that. <laughs> I went over the contract. I reviewed everything. And sometimes when people are crazy, there's not a lot you can do to prevent that. Leslie Smith is saying, I hate commissions. I always feel like they want too many specifics or I didn't charge enough to be happy with the amount of work that I did. Yes, I, I think that you have to make it worth it because honestly, if somebody wanted to pay me $50,000 for a painting, I'd be like, sure, I'll put up with whatever. <laughs> That's enough money for me to say, okay, I can absolutely deal with that. But again, it really depends. I mean, I'm the version of the person that should not be doing commissions. I feel like, Lauren, you're so much more patient and I feel like you have really carved a place for yourself that works for you. I think I just went into it 
with a very narrow-minded point of view that I'm going to paint portrait commissions, they're on oil, they're big, they're for very large clients. And maybe if I had gone into it with a more open mind, I could have had a better experience. But I'm sort of done with that chapter of my yeah. life. I mean, Clara, you teach, you do a lot of things that are not commissions. Again, like the art world is really huge. You can do a lot of different things. All of these are different ways of engaging with your community. I think like my community just kind of like puts up with me and is like, oh, you do this thing. Okay, let's like we can work together on this thing. We can treat it like kind of like a collaboration like that. Uh, I, I, I do it more as a way to like keep in touch with people in my life, I think. And it's mostly like more low level stuff. I don't treat it so much as like a, I guess, like a job, I guess. So it, and it, it sounds like the way that you were engaging with it was like a job, but you have so many other jobs that like fit your, like, you know, your experience and your realm, like really, really well. So why, why do you need to, you know? Remaining piece is saying, if I were to send you a work in progress piece, would you be comfortable pricing it from a professional standpoint? I'm curious what someone in the field would value it for. We get a lot of questions about that remaining piece. And actually, that's something that we really don't do because we think that it's somewhat of a sensitive topic. And yeah. I think it really depends on the situation and the artist. What do you think, Lauren? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, people ask us about uh, how much we should, how much someone should charge for a certain thing. And, you know, our, first of all, our audience here, you guys are amazing. You're across like the entire globe, like from so many different cultures, so many different places where artwork has a different standing in each of these places. Like the minimum wage actually is like vastly different from one place to another. So we like to give out some general guidelines like, okay, charge for your labor, charge for your materials, come up with like a good hourly set of, you know, what, what, what do you need hourly? Like what is worth it to you? And that's, generally a good place to start. Paige Elizabeth says, what do you do to gain exposure as an artist to start doing commissions? How important is social media in getting new clients? I think, Paige, it depends on the type of work. Like, Lauren, you probably do very well advertising your cat commissions on Instagram. For the large-scale portrait commissions that I did, not so much, although when I was doing them, there was no Instagram. This is a long time ago. But I'll tell you, actually, for me, the most effective thing was word of mouth because the really big commission that I did a couple of years ago, that was somebody who heard through the mom of a preschool parent. It was like one of those neighborhood things where their friends told their friends. And so I think you just have to make people know that you're out there and you're available. And I think that's important because I actively tell people I'm not available. So you just have to spread the yeah. word in that way. And I think social media, absolutely one of the most effective ways to go about doing that for sure. Yeah, I think um, actually the place that I get most of my com commissions, so the place where I get most of my sales in general is over Instagram, but the place where I get most of my commissions is actually over Facebook. I, I really don't like Facebook. I mean, for the numerous reasons that exist in the world right now, you know, Facebook's stressful. But as far as like uh, keeping in touch with, you know, say the people back in New Hampshire or people from college or, you know, wherever um, that I, I get most of my commissions from people that, again, know me in some way. So that that is the way that they get in contact with me. By the way, guys, we have an art prof share today. And this is actually a before and after art prof share, which to us is just the coolest oh, thing it. ever. So we are gonna look today at an artwork by Neil Espinoza from the Philippines. And if you guys go down to the video description below, you can read Neil's statement. So Neil explains that they are 17 years old. They've been making art for about a year. And so Neil submitted their digital painting, this one you're looking at right here, and we did critique it. So this is the thumbnail of the video. If you guys want to check that out later on, you can take a look. And so Neil explains that the critique he got from us taught them to look at other artists, 
really helped to see how other people tackle the same ideas and imagery. So we looked at these Russian artists. I think we looked at JMW Turner. So lots of examples of artists who paint big moody oceans, basically. And Neil says, the critique pushed me to experiment stylistically. I ended up creating another piece with the same concept, but in a different media. I had a lot of fun experimenting. He says, overall, I'm still not quite happy with it. I think it gets really boring fast, but I think I've learned a lot working on it, ready to apply those things to future works. Tell me in the chat, you guys, do you see a difference between Neil's first painting that we critiqued in the video and the one he did afterwards? Lauren, what's the difference that you see? This painting is crazy. I cannot believe it's by the same artist. I really cannot. Like, how did this painting get flipped in, like, you know, a, not a day, but like a week? It's so crazy. Like, everything from the textures to the color palette to the composition. Total, total revamp. Well, one of the biggest differences that Jordan and I, who did the critique with me, talked about was if you look at the first piece, we were really not sure what was going on with the boat that the figure was in. I couldn't tell what culture or time period it was, and it was a little bit vague. And then actually during the critique, Neil was there live, and Neil explained to us that actually, I can't remember the story exactly, but basically he made origami boats and somehow this played into the timeline. Neil, if you're watching live, correct me because I'm totally not remembering this accurately. And so we said, look, just make the origami boat. That's really specific and really personal. And Neil did it. And I feel like yeah. that origami boat, it's so much more interesting and unusual than the boat that was in the first painting. I mean, don't you see like what a big narrative difference there is? Yeah, I love that origami boat. I think suddenly, you know, we are in this kind of narrative world, you know, before in the first image, I really can't, you know, the colors are very dull in that first image. And it is hard for me to tell what is going on with that boat and also what is going on with the water in the face. And in the second image, the contrast of the lighting, the way that the boat feels much more real. It looks like it's been observed from an actual origami boat. Uh, the scale of it, it all adds to this kind of, you know, this, this story that I want to know more about. I think what's really cool to me, Lauren, is not just, I mean, the color's so vibrant, but the sense of space. I mean, you yeah. really can almost smell the ocean in the second version. And I remember Jordan and I were talking about how the turquoise shapes, like we weren't even sure what those were supposed to be, if it was like some weird ectoplasmic blob creature. And so yeah. I think just, oh my God, like I could not believe it. Neil, if you're watching this, this is an amazing improvement that you made. And we just are so happy to see this type of improvement. Yeah, Nikki T is saying, this is why critique needs to be 100% honest, not just say nice things about it. I like people to be brutal with their thoughts. And mm -hmm. Delilah says, yes, I wish people were willing to critique my art. Well, if you guys want to get some informal critiques, I really recommend that you join our Discord server because yeah, we really have good. lots of critique channels and we have some staff that are in there helping out here and there. But Honestly, people do a great job in the critique channels, don't you think, Lauren? Oh, yeah. It's crazy to me how we have, what is it, like 700 members now? And every single one of them offers super, super thoughtful critique. Like, we're talking about long form, like, this is what's working, this is what you could improve on, uh, very thoughtful questions, very thoughtful advice. It's, I have never been a part of a group like this before. It is incredible. And I would also tell you guys, if you make an artwork in response to one of our videos in whatever way you want, if you want to just show us, you can tag us on Instagram and use Art Prof Share. But if you want to be considered to get a YouTube shout out, like what we did with Neil today, just go to artprof.org, click on tutorials. And if you click on the purple button on the left, you'll see it will take you to an art prof share submission form and you just upload your information 
and we'll give you guys a shout out because this is honestly one of my favorite parts of Art Prof is watching you guys make stuff. It's so concrete and wonderful to watch that progress and see you guys really learning and making progress is really, really cool. Don't forget you guys, spring raffle two more days. If you yes. want us to keep doing this, I want to, but honestly, the reason we're running it is because I can't handle the administrative tasks anymore. We've just gotten so big that I just can't do it. Like Lauren, there's a big difference between now and two years ago, wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, I mean, when we were working on things two years ago, it was fine with just the, what, I think there were like seven of us. And, but that was like when we were just like coming up with ideas in Slack together. And now it's like, oh, you have to have people maintaining the website. You have to have like all the tech for the streams. Like we're doing streams every single night now. It used to be we made like a video, like, I don't know. It took forever to put out one video. So these things require a lot of labor in the background here that you guys don't see and a lot of um, materials that are hard to acquire. So this is like our NPR fundraiser here. <laughs> well, you know what it is, Lauren, is I think when we were a smaller platform and we were not as popular, it was okay for me to do that administrative work by myself. Like it was not overwhelming. I am like dying right now, you guys. Like I cannot keep this up forever. It's okay right now, but something really has to change in our budget so we can afford to hire administrative staff who can take care of spreadsheets. Because honestly, I think I have other skills that are more important than making Google spreadsheets. I'd much rather make content for you guys. I'd much rather edit studio tutorials and release them. I'd much rather pay our staff and have more streams. Lots of cool stuff we can do. Albert is asking, do you take volunteers? We actually don't, Albert, because to be honest, sometimes volunteers create more work for us. I know that sounds strange, but it takes a lot of work and time to train people. And let's just say we have really high standards and <laughs> don't really have time it's, it's, to be doing that so much. Standards, yeah. Yeah. It's so anyway, that that's just something to consider. Subscribe to our channel and ring the bell so you guys don't miss out on anything and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. Here is your shot. Not only do you get Patreon rewards, but you get entered into the raffle and there's so many cool things, you guys. I mean, don't you want to own Alex's gouache tutorial painting? That is the, I mean, I, I do sort of own it, but I'd rather give it out to somebody who's going to hang it on the wall and actually appreciate it as opposed to me putting it in a portfolio somewhere. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for contributing to this stream. Everybody stay safe. We'll see you next time. We'll be on the